grace and peace to you all. As one part of the Church of Jesus Christ, we are inspired and guided by Christ's vision of God's realm, one that includes all who seek to love God and neighbor. St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church welcomes all people, regardless of age, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, economic situation, family status, mental or physical abilities, to become part of the membership and ministry of the church. We welcome all of each of you, and we are glad that you are worshiping with us. As has become our custom, I invite you now to light a candle to set this screen time apart and to remind you of the presence of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, holding us together while we are apart. be called to worship. When we seek justice for the other, when we love kindness more than ever, we live as God asks us to live. When we walk humbly through life, when we offer mercy to those who are hurting, we are the blessing God hopes we will be. When we are willing to look foolish by following Jesus, when we choose weakness rather than power, we reflect the one who is in our midst.
God calls us to do good, care for one another, and follow God's life-giving commandments. Yet we fall short of who we are called to be, hurting those we are to love, and worshiping idols that never offer what they promise. Nevertheless, God is merciful and abounding in steadfast love. Therefore, we humbly, honestly, bravely confess our sin to God in the company of each other, confident that God forgives and frees us. Let us pray. We confess, Holy One, that often our faith is conditional. We confess that we are often foolish, yet believe ourselves wise. We trust you when we can see where we are going, and we believe your word when it makes sense with what we already know. The rest of the time, our voices can often be heard in the midst of the crowd demanding that you meet our expectations. Forgive us. Help us to trust where we have not seen. Teach us your way, foolish step by foolish step, until we find ourselves living your wisdom. Siblings in Christ, your sins are forgiven by the faith of Christ, who chose love over hatred and forgiveness over blame. Rejoice and be glad, for God's mercy is great. Jesus brings healing, justice, and peace. This morning, our Bible verse is 1 Peter, 2nd chapter, verses 11 through 25. Let us pray. Holy and eternal God, you have given us this day to hear and listen to your word. Let us receive your blessings for the coming days as we go about our lives doing your will. We are grateful for your word that gives us guidance and hope. Beginning at verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the desires of the flesh that wage war against the soul. Conduct, conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that though they may malign you as evildoers, they may see your honorable deeds and glorify God when he comes to judge. For the Lord's sake, accept the authority of every human institution, whether of the emperor as supreme or of governors as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing right, you should silence the ignorance of the foolish. As servants of God, live as free people, yet 
Do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. Honor everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves, accept the authority of your masters with all deference. Not only those who are kind and gentle, but also those who are harsh. For it is to your credit, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, where is the credit in that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you are going astray like sheep. Now you have to return to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our second scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. Look at your situation when you were called, brothers and sisters. By ordinary human standards, not many were wise, not many were powerful, not many were from the upper class. But God chose what the world considers foolish to shame the wise. God chose what the world considers weak to shame the strong. And God chose what the world considers low class and low life, what is considered to be nothing, to reduce what is considered to be something to nothing. So, no human being can brag in God's presence. It is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus. He became wisdom from God for us. This means that he made us righteous and holy, and he delivered us. This is consistent with what was written. The one who brags should brag in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now for our time with children, I want to look at this week's banner. You'll see that um, this banner is from the Theological Declaration of Barman. It was written 86 years ago in a little town in Germany called Barman. And I bet most of the grown-ups know what the pictures on this banner mean. I think this banner actually looks a little bit scary with the fire on the bottom. But there are also three different crosses that I want to show you. The first is a swastika. It's the black cross with the sort of bent arms at the top. For thousands of years, that was a really good symbol. But the Nazis in Germany started using it as their logo. And the Nazis did horrible and hateful things to people that they thought were different from them. Millions of people died because of what the Nazis did. And ever since, when people see the swastika, they usually think of those hateful and scary times. Now the other two crosses I want to point out are good. The next one is the big red X over the swastika. That one shows us that the hate of the Nazis was wrong. It is not at all how Jesus taught us to live and to treat other people. And then there's the third cross, and it's standing in the middle of the flames, reminding us that Jesus is more powerful than the Nazis or fire or any other kind of hate or awful thing. Even though this banner can look a little scary, when we see that third cross, we can remember God's love the love that Jesus showed us with his whole life, and that that love is stronger than hate and fear. And that is good news. So will you pray with me? Dear God, there are scary things in the world, and people do mean and hateful things. Help us always remember how Jesus showed us to live and how we can love and not hate. Amen. So do you all know what Godwin's Law is? Godwin's Law is an internet adage asserting that as an online discussion grows longer, the probability of a comparison involving Nazis or Hitler approaches one. It's not scientific, it's more observational, but the idea is that no matter what the original discussion topic, if it goes on long enough, Sooner or later, someone will compare someone or something to Adolf Hitler. And that's usually where the discussion ends. Well, you're only just going to get a second before we get to the Nazis and Hitler today. It's been almost 100 years since Hitler became the Fuhrer of Nazi, the Nazi party in Germany. And that is where we find ourselves today as we make our way through the Book of Confessions. As we've seen in the Scots Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, the Second Helvetic Confession, and the Westminster Abbey, in most of Europe up to this point, churches were closely connected to the government. And whatever the religion of the king was, that was the religion of the country. And the king also had power to appoint leaders of the church. So now fast forward or rewind with me to Germany in 1933 still suffering from the aftermath of the First World War, a certain man named Adolf Hitler was appointed chancellor. And within just a few months, some alarming changes began to take place. 
One of these changes was the adoption of the Führer principle, where Hitler was revered as the final and ultimate authority, where one race was elevated above all others, and most disconcerting, where one group of people were cast as scapegoats for the nation's ills. What may not be as well known was the church's role in all of this. The Nazi party feigned compatibility with Christianity. Most Germans took the union of Christianity, nationalism, and militarism for granted, and patriotic sentiments were equated with Christian truth. The German Christians exalted the racially pure nation and the rule of Hitler as God's will for Germany. A group of churches known as the German Christians held a national convention mere months after Hitler's rise to power and pledged to reorganize into a single national church. The study edition of the Book of Confessions says, Once Hitler's grip on power was assured, the Nazis began intervening coercively in church affairs. Among the most notorious laws that the Nazis enacted during these years was the so-called Aryan Paragraph, which called the exclusion from the church called for the exclusion from the church of all Christians with Jewish ancestry. This had the egregious effect of making race a direct criterion for church membership. Moreover, they expressed full-fledged support for a church rooted in German nationhood, based on an Aryan model. Hitler was viewed not just as authority over the state, but Lord over the German church, which now understood Christ and Christianity as uniquely Aryan. One German Christian document proclaimed it quite clearly. God has manifested himself not in Jesus Christ, but in Adolf Hitler. With frightening ease, the vast majority of German churches succumbed to these pressures and embraced them willingly. But not everyone went along with this. There was a group of Christians in Germany that would become known as the Confessing Church, who openly opposed the invasion of Nazi ideology into the body of Christ. And roughly a year later, over a period of just three days, 139 of them gathered in the small town of Barmen to adopt a declaration drafted by Reformed theologian Karl Barth, which expressly repudiated the claim that other powers apart from Christ could be sources of God's revelation. It never mentions Hitler, Nazi Germany, or the Third Reich by name. But it obviously speaks against these and speaks for Christ as the head of the church and the rightful focus of Christian allegiance. The Theological Declaration of Barman is different from some of the other documents we've looked at. It did not seek to lay out doctrine or to detail everything that a Christian should know and believe. It did not intend to start a new church, but to keep the church from being destroyed. The Barman Declaration includes six theses. Each of these theses declares a truth grounded in scripture, and these end up being affirmations that are followed by rejections. The confessing church declared that the yes of the gospel always entails a necessary no. And this was the way they intended to keep the church from being destroyed. Everything in Barman hangs on the first thesis, the first yes. This thesis is deceptively simple that Jesus Christ is the one word which we have to hear and which we have to trust and obey in life and in death. Therefore, we reject the false doctrine that the church should acknowledge any source of authority or proclamation other than Jesus Christ. In other words, the church is called to give its primary allegiance to Jesus and obey him before all other authorities. The second thesis carries this out, referencing our reading from 1 Corinthians. Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness, and sanctification and redemption. For the confessing church, that meant that God claims our whole lives, and therefore 
There are no areas of our lives in which we do not belong to Jesus. So there is no way to separate out some part of the Christian's life over which it is right or acceptable for, acceptable for anyone or anything other than Christ to lay claim. And near the end of the declaration, in the fifth thesis, thesis, the authors quote our other scripture reading for today from 1 Peter. Like the Christians who gathered at Barman, the writer of this letter found himself in a strange and foreign land in late first century Asia Minor. He and the Christian community he was writing to were, in essence, spiritual and social exiles. They were marginalized people living at the edges of power and prestige. First Peter is the writer's attempt to help good Christians also be good citizens. In fact, making the case that being a good citizen in a society opposed to Christian tenets is in fact a faithful witness to the Christ they believe in. But there are limits to this. It's the 17th verse that the Theological Declaration of Barman quotes, rendered more fully in this way. Show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, love God, honor the emperor. Did you notice the structure of those words? Four brief statements, the first and last pertaining to the world outside the church doors, to which you should show proper respect and honor. And then the middle two focusing on fellow siblings in Christ and Christ himself, whom you are to love. First Peter's message makes clear that the Christian community is called to interact and engage in the larger world, even and especially a world that does not conform to or even acknowledge Christian norms. But in no way should the church ever capitulate to that world or confuse respect and honor with love. We are called to live fully in our world, to vote, to run for city council, to protest, to join the school PTA. We are called to respect our elected leaders even if we disagree with them. The Confessing Church makes it very clear that ultimate allegiance must not be to a political party or to a candidate or to an issue. It is okay to be involved with these issues and candidates, but if they ever call us to do something that is contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we must reject them. As Christians, Jesus alone is our Lord. First Peter is clear on where our ultimate devotion and allegiance lies. Just like the first thesis of the declaration, with the God who created us and loves us still, and not the human-made institutions and structures or humankind itself. Bart and his confessing church colleagues would incorporate First Peter into their declaration saying this. Scripture tells us that in the as yet unredeemed world, in which church also exists. The state has, by divine appointment, the task of providing for justice and peace. The church acknowledges the benefit of this divine appointment in gratitude and reverence before him. We reject the false doctrine as though the state, over and beyond its special commission, should and could become the single and totalitarian order of human life, thus fulfilling the church's vocation as well. In other words, Third Reich, hands off the church. The Confessing Church's stand at Barman, which by today's light seems so prescient, so courageous, and so daring, was at the time by no means self-evident. Each of these yeses and nos were far more bold and radical than we can really understand now. It cost some members of the Confessing Church their freedom, even their life. And yet later, some of its writers would lament that it wasn't strong enough, that they didn't specifically name Hitler, Nazi Germany, or the Third Reich, that they didn't do more to stand in opposition to the horrific and devastating effects of that evil. Sadly, the Barman Declaration is more relevant to us now than we wish. We live in very strange times. Our reality is more polarized and political than it has been in a generation. 
or at least in my generation. We are 79 days from the general election. This is our 23rd Sunday in this new reality. The coronavirus rages as we argue about science and liberty, as we try to get it under control. We're struggling to come to terms with 400 years of racial oppression and to see a new way forward. And we're facing an economic crisis for which there is not a clear path out. It is strange and it is scary. We live in a time ruled by fear. Fear of those we do not know. Fear of those who think, live, look, or believe differently than we do. Fear of the next terrorist attack. Fear of where the next mass shooting will occur, where the next modern day lynching will be caught on cell phone video. Fear of being crushed by an economy teetering on the brink of collapse. Fear of a virus which doesn't care how long you've been sheltering in place or how much you miss sharing a meal with your friends in a restaurant or how important football is in the South. A virus about which we are still learning. Fear of all those things out of our control and beyond number. Though the details have changed, the fear is the same. It was fear that lay at the very heart of the rise of Nazi Germany and the church's complicity and furthering of that rise. And it is fear that undergirds much of our current political, cultural, economic, and religious dialogue. And like Bart and the folks who adopted the Theological Declaration of Barman, we in our day and time must bring to light all those fears and openly name them in the same way the late preacher and Harvard professor Peter Gomes chose to speak it. He said, Fear represents the absence of courage and a poverty of imagination. To be defined by our fears is to accept as normal the lowest possible level of emotional intelligence. Pastor Steve Lindsay warns what happens when we in the church find ourselves ruled by fears and not the hope and saving grace of the gospel. He says, We are not at our best as a church or a society. We not only allow demagogues and narcissists to assume positions of power and influence, but we, against our better judgment in less fearful times, cede authority to them. That is how things like the Holocaust happen. That is how a candidate for president can run on a platform of wall building and religion banning. That is how the voice of reason and gun legislation gets trumped by the unreasonable voice of gun escalation. That is how the stains of racism our country supposedly once dealt with, continue to haunt us in ugly and violent ways. Unless we speak up, unless when we speak the truth in love together as the church, we come to see the hard truth as voiced famously by German pastor Martin Niemöller. First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. And then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. So what is the church's response? For the writers of 1 Corinthians and 1 Peter, for the confessing church movement, for the church today. How can we, individually and as a church, speak over and above the fear that lies at the heart of our societal dysfunction? I think Gomes has an answer for it. Listen, he says, the opposite of fear is compassion. The fear that we do not know and the mother of, the, we fear what we do not know and the mother of fear is ignorance. Compassion, however, leaves no room for fear, for we are too busy doing what we can, what we must, and what God wishes us to do, to take time to fear the consequences. Compassion has to do with the exercise of that inner strength that allows us power in the face of powerlessness 
and of the powers that be. Friends, compassion is what enables us to respect our leaders and love our God and not get the two mixed up. Compassion is what calls us to speak the truth in love when we see instances where that line is crossed so that like the confessing church in Nazi Germany, the voice of the gospel and God's ever-present love are proclaimed and heard not just inside the walls of the church or in our YouTube echo chambers, but out in the world, in the marketplace, on Main Street and Wall Street, in Capitol buildings and legislative halls, and throughout our world. Germany and the world had to endure ten more years of Hitler's tyranny. But the church's witness was not futile. Albert Einstein stated, Only the church stood across the path of Hitler's campaign for suppressing the truth. I am forced to confess that what I once despised, I now praise unreservedly. Einstein saw the power of the gospel to enable the church to stand against the forces of oppression in his time. Friends, may we never be silent when it comes to proclaiming who our God is and where our ultimate allegiance lies. May we not just believe in the power of compassion over fear, but live into that compassion every day of our lives. And may we once again reclaim this confession as a rallying cry for the Church of Jesus Christ to be stalwart in the cause of God's justice in our time and place. Amen. And now let us join together in affirming our faith, declaring our yeses with the words from the Theological Declaration of Barman. Jesus Christ, as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God, which we have to hear and which we have to trust and obey in life and in death. As Jesus Christ is God's assurance of the forgiveness of all our sins, so in the same way and with the same seriousness is he also God's mighty claim upon our whole life. Through him befalls us a joyful deliverance from the godless fetters of this world for a free, grateful service to his creatures. Amen. We are glad that you are joining us today in worship. If you are looking for a church home, we would love to have you join us at St. Andrews, officially through membership or just as part of our community. You may contact me if you would like to know more about membership or becoming a part of this congregation. I'd be glad to talk to you about that. I do hope you all will check out our Facebook page and website for information about our regular online gatherings for study, nurture, and fellowship. In your prayers, uh, please remember those on the prayer list that we sent out to our worshiping community. Also, remember the health care workers and essential workers who must go to work every day to keep things going. Remember those home recovering from recent hospitalizations and surgeries, those continuing in cancer treatment, those without work or struggling financially, those making decisions about opening or remaining closed, those who work for justice and equity in our communities. And we remember especially the teachers and students and administrators and parents who have started school or will be starting school very soon. We keep them all in our prayers. And now let us pray. Good and gracious God, so many of your people are hurting. There seems no end in sight to the uncertainty and pain of this season. Parents and caregivers are worried about children's well-being as the school year approaches and the pandemic persists. This living, those living in group care facilities yearn to be able to have visitors again, and the loneliness of those already isolated grows. The economic fallout from this virus gets deeper and wider as many scramble to find work and put food on the table. 
It feels, at times, as if we call out to you and you do not respond. We call out to you now, Lord Christ. Have mercy on us. Hear our cries. Help us. We call out for mercy for those on the front lines of fighting for justice. We call out for mercy for those on the front lines of fighting this pandemic. We call out for mercy for those grieving the death of loved ones. We call out for mercy for those who comfort them. We call out for mercy for those without food or housing, medical care or community. We call out for mercy on behalf of those who do not have the strength to raise their own voices. We call out for mercy for ourselves, trusting that you know our deepest needs even if we do not have the wisdom to name them. Hear us, Lord. Heal us, Lord. Help us, Lord. When we fear you have walked away from us in our desperation, send your Holy Spirit to remind us yet again that God does not reject God's people, that the call and gifts of God are irrevocable. Embed in us the biblical stories that teach us that even that which we intend for evil, you, Lord God, use for good. Grant us faith so that we will persist in advocating for the vulnerable and hurting no matter how long it takes for our world to be made well. Give us faith, Almighty God, to keep focused on our Savior, following the way, loving you and our neighbors until the one we worship comes again and come again he will. We make our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God, your providence is evident when we take a long, loving look at our lives. The twists and turns, the disappointments and hurts, none of them were absent of your grace and purpose. So aware that you do not reject or abandon us, but remain with us always, we respond with gratitude, giving in joy our morning's offerings with confidence that you will use it to reveal your care to others. Let us now joyfully commit our time, talent, and treasure to God as we sing together. Us pray. Generous God, you have chosen to reveal yourself to us in ways this world considers foolish, and you call us to join you. As we learn generosity in the midst of a world that teaches self sufficiency, bless our gifts that they may be a blessing to others. 
As we learn trust in the midst of a world that teaches individualism, bless our gifts, that they may lead us into community. As we learn sacrifice in the midst of a world that teaches greed, bless our gifts, that they may remind us of all you have given to us. We dedicate these, our gifts of treasure and talent, to the foolishness of your glory. Amen. As the story goes, the sunny afternoon of May 31st, 1934 was one of those rare moments when human beings become aware of their exact position in history, of the brevity of their lives and the significance of their decisions. According to many accounts, the representatives of the Lutheran and Reformed traditions who met in Barmen, Germany that afternoon sensed even then the magnitude of what they had done. The Barman Declaration was approved unanimously. Stephanie von Mackensen, the one-woman delegate, later claimed that she had felt the presence of the Holy Spirit sweep through the room. And those assembled rose spontaneously and began to sing, Now thank we all our God. May we be so moved as we join together in song. And now, 
Go out into the world to live your hopes and not your fears, knowing that you are held in holy hands that will never let you go. Alleluia. Amen. After our sung benediction today, you are invited to join us over in our virtual narthex on Zoom, where you can pass the peace and share in a time of fellowship. And so as we depart from our worship gathering to carry our worship out into the world, let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. Go in peace. Amen.